<clears throat> Hello, class. Back again to pick up where we left off with the Spanish-American War. This is lecture number seven for History 102. So, remember, I just talked about uh, the bravery of Admiral Dewey, Theodore Roosevelt, Leonard Wood, and the Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War, which comes to an end in August of 1898. Now, they're going to go to the peace table in Paris and hammer out a treaty to end this war between the United States and Spain. Now, Spain, uh, as a result of this war, is going to hand over to the Americans uh, some significant territory. The first thing they're going to do is hand over Cuba to the United States. Now, the fate of Cuba has already been determined by an amendment that was placed on an appropriations bill in Congress in 1898 that paid for the costs of the Spanish-American War. And that amendment's known as the Teller Amendment, added to this appropriations bill by a Congressman Teller. And what it basically said was, if... Uh, Cuba is captured and as a result of the Spanish-American War and becomes U.S. territory, that the United States guarantees that they will set Cuba free and independent. This is to squash claims that the United States created this war just because we wanted Cuba for ourselves. So we go into the war basically pledging part of our quest is to gain independence for Cuba. So we're going to end up doing that, as, you can, as you'll find out. The second piece of territory that the United States gains is another Spanish colony, the island of Puerto Rico. This is how the United States gains Puerto Rico, which we still possess today. And today, Puerto Rico is a commonwealth of the United States, not a state. Now, we'll talk about what happens in Puerto Rico here shortly. The third territory that they gain in the so-called spoils of war is the Pacific island of Guam, another Spanish colony. Now, Guam is way out in the center of the Pacific, further, way further out than Hawaii, and we still hold that island today. Today, basically, it is naval stations, army bases uh, for the United States military. So those are the three things that we received for winning this war. But then comes the issue of the Philippines, which we unfortunately captured a couple days late. Spain won't give it up. So the United States at the negotiation table agrees to pay Spain $20 million dollars for the Philippines. So this treaty that is reached between Spain and the United States now has to go to the next step. It has to be ratified by the United States Senate with a two-thirds majority. This treaty is going to be hotly debated in the United States Senate, and the real sticking point is the Philippines. Now, there's going to be uh, a lot of debate and a lot of famous people are going to testify in front of Congress giving their views on why we really shouldn't pay $20 million for the Philippines. One of them is George, or excuse me, uh, Booker T. Washington. He will get in front of Congress and argue that $20 million would be much better spent on education. And that's what we should be doing, not buying a, a, you know, a former colony 10,000 miles away from the United States. Another famous person who testifies in front of Congress is the great labor leader, Samuel Gompers. He is questioning what will be the status of the Philippines. Will it become an American colony? 
Will the workforce there be exploited as inexpensive labor, which will be in direct competition with American laborers who he cares about? He wants some questions answered, and they're very good questions. Finally, in the most dramatic moment, Andrew Carnegie testifies, and he argues that we should not buy the Philippines and keep it in any shape or form where it could be called an American colony because the United States should never have colonies. It smacks against our principles and our previous history. We didn't like being British colonies, so we fought for independence. The Filipinos don't want to be an American colony. So, in a very dramatic move, Andrew Carnegie reaches into his vest pocket pulls out his checkbook, writes a check for $20 million, and hands it to the Senate and says, here, I'll pay the $20 million for the Philippines if you guarantee me you set those people free immediately. Obviously, Carnegie's got the $20 million to be writing the check. We've already talked about his generosity. And unfortunately, the Senate foolishly gives him back his check. They pass the treaty and the Philippines sort of sits in limbo. No one knowing, are they a colony? Are we going to grant them their independence? And it's going to be a mess, as we'll find out. A revolution will happen there uh, at the turn of the century. More Americans will die in the Filipino insurrection than died in the Spanish-American War. The Filipino people will take a terrible toll. And they'll sort of sit in limbo all the way till 1946, when the United States finally grants the Philippines its independence the year after World War II ends. Now, let's talk about the fate of Cuba and Puerto Rico. So, Cuba needs to be prepared before we grant them their independence. They're war-torn. They've been a colony since 1500, and they're not prepared to be an independent nation. So the United States will do a whole host of internal improvements in the Philippines, or excuse me, in Cuba. They will uh, build schools, hospitals, roads, bring electricity to Cuba. And the person that will be in charge of all this will be former Rough Rider Leonard Wood, who has now been promoted to the position of General Wood. And he'll be the Governor General of Cuba while he transforms them into an independent nation. Now, uh, also very important what happens down in Cuba during this time period is an army physician who was there, and you've probably heard of this man before. His name is Dr. Walter Reed. Dr. Walter Reed will find a cure while he's in Cuba for the horrible disease yellow fever. Now, uh, he will find this cure. It will be his claim to fame. It'll be a blessing to the entire world, and especially to the Cubans. And you probably have heard of him today because there's a very famous Army Medical Center outside of Washington, D.C. in Bethesda, Maryland, the Walter Reed Medical Center, named in his honor. Now, as far as Puerto Rico goes, Puerto Rico, when we took it over, had one million inhabitants. And we're going to do the same thing we did in Puerto Rico that we did in Cuba, a whole series of internal improvements. We'll be, build schools, hospitals, roads, and so forth. But the difference is we will not grant them their independence. Uh, in 1917, 
Puerto Ricans will officially become U.S. citizens. Then later, uh, they'll gain the status of being a U.S. Commonwealth. And that's where they still stand today. They're not a state. They're not a territory, but they're a commonwealth, which is a unique governmental uh, status. So Puerto Rico, we still hold today. Guam, we still hold today. We granted the Filipino people their independence in 1946, but unfortunately, a horrible insurrection or war happened in 1900, 1901, and it was devastating, especially for the Filipino people. So now what we want to talk about next is we want to talk about the rise of Theodore Roosevelt. And this is a pretty interesting story. Roosevelt, after his uh, bravery he exhibited with the Rough Riders, returns back to his home state of New York. Now, many of you may know Theodore Roosevelt was born in Manhattan, and he lived out on Long Island at Oyster Bay at his famous ho home, Sagamore. Now, he returns back to New York, and he's immediately recruited by the Republican Party to run for the governorship of the state of New York, writing off his popularity that he has gained as a Rough Rider. Everybody knew about the Rough Riders in the United States in 1898. 1898 was an election year for the governor's position. So Roosevelt, who has some political experience, had been a New York State Assemblyman, hears the call and runs for the governorship. He'll be elected governor in November of 1898. He'll take office in January 1899, and shortly after he's sworn in, the Republican Party, which he ran as a Republican, will request a meeting with him in the governor's mansion in Albany. Now, at this meeting, all these Republican power brokers sit Roosevelt down and they think they're going to tell him, okay, here's what you're going to do as governor. Here's a list of people we want you to appoint to important positions like commissioner of education, commissioner of this, that, the other thing. And here's an agenda for legislation we want to see you push through this year. Roosevelt listens patiently to these Republican big shots. Then he stands up and basically says, get the hell out of the governor's mansion. I'm the governor of the state of New York, and you're not. The people elected me. I already have a list of people I'm appointing to all those important positions, and I already have my legislative agenda that I'm going to outline in my State of the State address. So get out and you're not welcome here anymore. This stuns these Republican power brokers, but obviously they know Roosevelt means business. Now Roosevelt finds himself in a position where he ran as a Republican but the Republican hierarchy of New York can't stand him because they see him as a maverick. Roosevelt then will serve two years as governor. And then in 1900, uh, that's a presidential election year. President William McKinley, who had won the election in 1896 and had a quite the first four years as president, just to kind of sum up what McKinley accomplished, he finally put an end to the panic of 1893. And by 1900, the United States economy was roaring forward as it had been. He also fought the splendid little war, won it, won the uh, United States more uh, prestige and recognition in the world with our great white fleet, added territory to the United States, namely Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, and now America was riding high again. McKinley is going to pick a new person to be his vice president as his previous vice president had decided to retire. 
So it's all up in the air. And back at this day and age, you didn't find out who was going to run for vice president until the parties held their conventions. So what the Republican Party of New York does is they come up with a scheme. They want to get rid of Theodore Roosevelt as governor of the state of New York. They can't stand him. So their big plan is let's export him. So they come up with a plan where they're going to nominate him at the Republican National Convention to be the vice presidential candidate to run with President William McKinley. Now, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's advisors find out about this scheme and they're all prepared for it. Roosevelt obviously has to attend the convention as a very prominent Republican, the governor of the largest state population-wise in 1900, which New York was. And they're all set for Roosevelt to get up on the stage after he's nominated and to respectfully decline and make a speech where he basically says, I have too much work to do still in New York. I've only been governor two years. I'm going to fulfill my term. I'm not interested, but thank you. So the fateful day comes. These New York Republican operatives nominate Roosevelt. Roosevelt gets up on the stage with every intention of respectfully declining, but to his surprise, numerous members of the Rough Riders, his old college pals, are at this convention. They will jump up on the stage with Roosevelt when he gets up there, and it'll almost be like a Rough Rider reunion right on stage. The entire crowd will start cheering, Teddy, Teddy. The Rough Riders will all put him up on their shoulder and then Roosevelt, being caught up in the emotions of the moment, will accept the nomination to be the vice presidential candidate. Now, one thing we'll find out about Roosevelt, if you don't know this already, he's a very emotional guy. And he got caught up in the heat of the moment, foolishly accepted this nomination, as far as his advisors were concerned, and anybody at the time would say. And then when he gets off the stage, his advisors are there waiting for him, shaking their heads, basically saying, what'd you do? I thought we went through this. You were going to decline it. And Roosevelt basically said, Sorry, you know me, I got caught up in the heat of the moment. I guess I'm going to be vice president of the United States. So another person at the convention was not happy. That's William McKinley's very close friend, Mark Hanna. Mark Hanna was a iron tycoon from Ohio that had got all of his big business buddies to back McKinley in 1896 with a lot of money, he's known back in the day as a quote-unquote kingmaker. He really helped McKinley rise to the position of president with big business backing that he arranged. Hannah was seated in the front row and said to one of his buddies seated next to him, this isn't good. And he says, quote, now that damn wild-eyed cowboy is going to be a heartbeat away from the presidency of the United States, namely vice president. So the election of 1900 takes place, and it's a rematch, which doesn't happen very often. William McKinley will be running for re-election. William Jennings Bryan will run against him for a second try. His second try isn't going to be any more successful than his first, and it's going to be sort of a replay. William McKinley will run his election from the front porch of his Canton, Ohio home, and the Republicans will bring the crowds to him. William Jennings Bryan, just as he did in 1896, will travel thousands of miles by train delivering hundreds of speeches, but to no avail, 
William McKinley will be reelected in 1900. Now, Theodore Roosevelt will have the time of his life. Many of the Rough Riders will join him on the campaign trail. They'll get their horses and old uniforms. They'll ride through cities campaigning. Roosevelt will deliver speeches in his old Rough Riders outfit. And he just has the time of his life traveling the United States and campaigning for he and President McKinley. So McKinley wins uh, a resounding uh, re-election in 1900, which makes Theodore Roosevelt vice president of the United States. Now, Roosevelt and McKinley are sworn in for McKinley's second term in March of 1901, as still the tradition is. And something is going to happen in September of 1901. President McKinley will travel to the state of New York. He comes here and travels to Buffalo because in Buffalo that summer, they were holding an event known as the Pan-American Exposition. It was a huge deal. It's kind of like a World's Fair where countries from uh, North America and South America or the Western Hemisphere all built these elaborate exhibits showcasing their countries, and the United States as host built a whole series of exhibits, uh, you know, promoting what the United States was all about business-wise, culturally, and so forth. So President McKinley travels there to tour this grand place, and it was quite a sight. While he was touring the Pan-American Exposition in September of 1901, a anarchist by the name of Leon Salog, I can't ever pronounce his last name, so I'm going to spell it for you. His last name is spelled C-Z-O-L-O-G-Z. -O -O We're going to just call him Leon. Leon and another, a whole group of worldwide anarchists had come up with this plot that in a series of a couple days, he and others around the world were going to assassinate world leaders. So Leon approaches President McKinley at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, pulls a weapon, and shoots him in the chest. Now, President McKinley is whisked off to the hospital in Buffalo with his life on the line. It's life or death for President McKinley, and nobody knows if he'll survive this gunshot wound delivered to him by Leon, the anarchist. Now, at this point, Vice President Theodore Roosevelt is on a speaking tour and preparing to have a vacation in the Adirondacks that he traditionally does with his family every September. And believe it or not, when McKinley is shot, Vice President Roosevelt is right here in the North Country. He's on Isle Lamont on Lake Champlain, and he's making a speech at the governor of Vermont's uh, camp on Isle Mont, known as the Fisk Farm. He's making this speech for a wildlife uh, and hunting group in Vermont. And that day he had gone on a tour of a brand new fish hatchery that had opened on Isle Mont with the governor. He was the keynote speaker at this fundraiser for Vermont wildlife, which Roosevelt was a big advocate of. And that's where he was when McKinley was shot. So government agents came and interrupted this wildlife dinner and whisked Theodore Roosevelt away to the train station to get him to Buffalo to be by the side of President McKinley because it was touch and go in the hospital in Buffalo. So this is where I'm gonna end this lecture. Next uh, lecture that I deliver, We'll pick up with 
ultimately what happens to President McKinley. And we'll be talking about uh, how this affects Theodore Roosevelt and the United States of America. So that's it for today. I hope you all are healthy and fine. And New York pause has been extended for another two weeks till April 29th. So I encourage you all to follow the governor's orders and stay home as much as possible. It seems that we have COVID-19 under control in the North Country with the limited amount of cases, but that will only remain if we follow these orders and stay home. So everybody take care, be safe. See you soon. Bye now.